Good afternoon, and welcome to the joint service of St. John Lutheran Church and Peace Lutheran Church. We welcome you to our service. Today is the 19th Sunday of Pentecost, and we're thankful to God that you're here to worship with us today. Your presence is a gift from God, and may he bless our worship time together. I am Pastor Mike Robelch, and I will be leading the service this morning. If you would like to receive copies of the bulletin and sermon prior to the service, please email us at P-E-A-C-E-L-U-T-H-C-H at gmail.com. Or you can send a DM at either of our Facebook pages, Peace Lutheran Church of Pico Rivera, California, or St. John Lutheran Church, North Long Beach. May I also send in a request via mail. Our mailing address is 9412 Shade Lane, Pico Rivera, California, 90660. If you would like to send a prayer request in, you may send it in in either one of those methods. Please join me in the responsive readings during the course of the service. begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent to them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. <clears throat> Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, beginning in verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said that on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our epistle lesson for today comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, beginning in the fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly now at length that you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know now to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. 
And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call on those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves had been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Have you ever faced the question about who is God and how do you know? I've seen it in a number of forms, and I guess the most unusual case was regarding a wedding of a young lady to her husband. She had grown up in a single parent family. Her mother had shared her bed with a significant number of men of a number of different races and had married none of them. It was a matter of whoever tickled her fancy at the time and she drifted from man to man and her children, which there were six or seven of them, each had a different father. Mom was white and the fathers were white and black and Asian. So each of the children had a unique look to them. Family resemblance was not something that was easy to identify. Anyhow, this young lady had never known what she would call a normal family life. Her brothers and sisters were frankly flabbergasted that she was getting married at all. But then to get married in a church, it was utterly incomprehensible to them. Nothing in their shared family experience had prepared them for that, and they thought this behavior was bizarre. One of them came up to her in the parish hall, and I happened to be standing close to her, and asked her in the most bewildered tone, why are you getting married here? And 
I have to admit there was a, a bit of pride when I heard her answer because she said, and she said to him, because this is my church. Not the same question as who is God, but in her family, it really amounted to the same thing. None of them knew God or anything about him. And she had completed adult instruction. She had made a confession in front of the entire congregation. And she had been baptized and confirmed and welcomed into the congregation just a few months before. Our Old Testament text tells us of the day when the answer to that question will finally be evident and available to all. And our theme this morning is, see, this is our God. Our Old Testament text tells us of the day when the answer to that question is evident. The text in today's pictures for us the gospel. There is no cross, and it does not use the word resurrection, but it is all tied in. What is it pictured for us in this prophecy of heaven? The trouble is I can't point to any specific thing that can't be said right now with the possible exception of wiping away all tears from all faces. That is why I say that this gospel pictured for us in the terms of the results, and when we face those results, we can proudly say, see, this is our God. This prophecy rests on the understanding of the truth that our religion is somehow is something that might well be described as already and not yet. Already we know, but not yet quite do we perceive these things with our senses. Already we possess these treasures, but do not yet fully enjoy that possession. There is nothing about our salvation or your salvation that remains unfinished, that we do not possess already. Nonetheless, there is much about it that is not yet within our experience. We have the resurrection already. We have eternal life already. We have life with God in his presence already. It's not yet part of our sense in our personal experience of these things. We don't see it. We can't feel it. So it seems to us not yet but it is because he has risen. In that day, says our text, well, today is that day. The lavish banquet is prepared. We have been invited and we have been brought into the banquet. That has to be the facts because we are the mountain of the Lord. This is where the banquet is to be served, at least until we sit at the table with Jesus in glory. Remember, the mountain of the Lord is the place where his glory dwells. Well, we, the church, are the place where the glory of God dwells among men. The gospel is his glory. Those in whom the gospel bears its blessed fruit are his glory. God dwells in each of us what believes. He is present amongst us wherever two or three are gathered together in his name. This is the place where God promised in his prophecy to prepare the lavish bank banquet, and he has indeed prepared it. Look at the language used to describe it. Aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, and refined aged wine. Well, we all know about aged wine, and the best from what the experts tell us, is Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, approximately 1946. It's a very fine wine, and being a very fine wine, it's also very pricey. I remember sitting around the uh, dinner table, usually on Sundays, and my grandmother would grab the round bone from the steak, and she would begin sucking the moro out. And she invariably would say, oh, the morrow's the best part. I eat that morrow to this day, 
because of my grandmother and she had said that it was the best part. But to be honest with you, I never developed the enthusiasm that she did. Don't get me wrong, I still like it, but I never got to the point of her joy in eating it. And what could be better than the banquet of the Lord's Supper? It is here where we receive him in his true body and very blood. And with him, we all also receive everything he has won. And by his grace and promise, everything the heavenly father has given to him. This banquet is the resurrection from the grave for us, not just for Jesus. It is life everlasting beyond sin in all its effect. No more, no more pain, no more sickness, no more sorrow, and no more dying ever. This banquet is the one Jesus spoke of as the wedding feast. He included it in several parables. We call it the wedding feast of the lamb to his bride, the church. The banquet is eternal life and salvation. Yet consider this, we possess these things already right now. We do not experience them as present realities, not yet. Nonetheless, the lavish banquet is before us for it begins in the church. One item on the menu of this banquet is the veil that covers all nation. That veil is death. And while it is mentioned on the menu, it's not for us, but for God to swallow up and God will bring an end to death for all eternity. But that is another reason why I say that the banquet has already begun. God has already swallowed up death. He has put an end to death by putting his son to death on the cross in our place. Death is all done with. That is the good news of the gospel. Jesus has destroyed death. God has swallowed up the covering which rests on all people everywhere. Death is dead, and he is dead for everyone. Death was killed by the death of life because life could not be destroyed by death. And when life rose from the grave on Easter morning, he destroyed death in his path. Of course, this is the already not yet part again. All of this is true already, but not yet do we see it or enjoy it fully. That is why on the great day, when everyone experiences it, we will shout for joy and say, see, this is our God. This is the salvation we waited for. This is what the people of old waited for. Our victory is won. Our death has been destroyed. When do, we, when do we do what people call dying, we will discover that it is a door to everlasting life. But we will all physically die, at least out from this world and from the flesh. That is a certainty unless Christ returns before that day comes for you and I. And in that day, always, accompanied by tears and sorrow. But for those of us who understand and who believe, it is rightly sorrow at being left behind and sorrow at the separation, but not sorrow about the beloved. Nonetheless, there is sorrow and pain and grief. That is the nature of death. And that is rightly why it's called an enemy. The gospel puts an end to all that. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, you and I shall rise. His resurrection guarantees and demonstrates what our res resurrection shall be. This is why we Christians cry out, hallelujah. We can see the joy even on those days when we cannot feel it. But the day is coming when we too shall rise. This is also what the gospel is all about. We will rise from our graves. We will have transformed bodies and rise to eternal life and to a reunion that is joyful and delightful beyond all expression here and now. 
This is the day when the promise of our text shall be accomplished, and the Lord God will wipe away from tears from all faces. Sorrow will be a thing of the past. It will be gone because all that causes sorrow will be ended, wiped away like a covering of dust on furniture. Sin causes death, but it also causes sickness and sorrow and frustration, anger and fear, impatience and despair. All of the fruits of the sin will be gone as well. God will remove all the sources of sorrow and dismay and will give us a clear understanding of the true joy of our circumstances. As if seeing those we have loved and lost again will not be enough, we will be us and they will be them and we will know one another and delight in one another in that day. And that is the day that we will shout for joy. See, this is our God. This is what we have waited for, as Isaiah says. And he will be removed the reproach of his people from all the earth. That reproach is our sin and our dying because of our sin. Because God created us for an eternity with him. He created us for communion with him. He created us to live in his love and bask in his glory. He created you and I to live in thanksgiving and joy because of his great goodness and abundant generosity. Our sins, however, have made that impossible, and we have proved to be unable to rescue ourselves from this or even to resist sin. So God took sin out the way he carried it to the cross himself and killed us in his own son. Now he makes us alive in him. We are forgiven and never to die except the flesh part. And then only for a time. Our reproach is gone and in its place, we who were created merely in his image have become partakers of much, much more having been claimed by God as family, as his own children. When this world is done and the banquet is all that remains for us, we will be more than merely without sin. We shall positively be holy and like Jesus, whatever that may be, for the scripture says in 1 John, Beloved, now we are children of God and is not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. On that final day is the day that we are still awaiting when the treasures of our salvation are not hidden from us, but fully experienced and fully sensed and fully realized. That is the ultimate day of the banquet when we shall relish the feast as we should, as it deserves. And on that day, we shall see God and know him without reservation or doubt or uncertainty. Then we shall shout for joy the words of our text, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. See, this is our God. We know this, for as Isaiah tells us, the Lord has spoken. All of this is certain because it is the word of God. It is not merely pious and wishful thinking, but the promise of God and the very substance of our faith. It is important to remember that it is just not high in the sky by and by, it is already true and real, even if it is not to our immediate senses. Jesus has accomplished it already, but we do not possess it in its fullness, not yet. We still look forward to sharing completely with Jesus in the resurrection and in this lavish banquet. But even now, we have the answer to the question about who really is God and what is he like? And we know 
and we can say with confidence, see, this is our God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Let us confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us take time for prayer. Almighty God, you have blessed us in love with the Savior to whom the nations cry and in whom there is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Grant to us your Holy Spirit, the Comforter whom you have promised that we and all who call on his name shall be saved. Help us to treasure in our hearts your mercy and to give ourselves fully to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you delivered your word through Moses and the prophets and fulfilled your word in Christ. He was planted into death for our sins and raised for our justification. And in him, all the nations of the earth shall be united. Give us pastors who will preach this word faithfully and church workers who are devoted to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have promised the thirsty will drink and from the empty will flow forth rivers of living water. Help us to show forth in holy lives the fruits of the Spirit and to live with love toward our neighbor. Give us a servant's heart that doesn't seek our own way, but walks on the path of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have promised to make one people for many. Take from us all pride, prejudice, and hate, that we may not hinder the cause of the gospel by our shame, but give welcome to all people in the name of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have ordered all things on heaven and on earth. Bless Donald, our president, Gavin, our governor, the Congress of the United States, and all elected and appointed civil servants, that the rule of law may protect the weak, preserve life from conception to its natural end, and peace may reign for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, have mercy and spare us. Put an end to the pandemic and restore the communities of the world to their common life. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have given our nation the gift and heritage of freedom. It came at the cost of many lives on the battlefield far and near. Receive our thanks for their sacrifice and give us the courage to preserve liberty in our own time and to use it honorably. Preserve and protect those who continue to serve us in the military, in law enforcement, and as first responders. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you breathe hope into the weary and renew your church by your grace. Bless newly planted congregations that they may endure. Guide established congregations that they may not lose heart. And build up our synod that our zeal for your kingdom may not flag but flourish and prosper according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your word endures forever. Give us grace so that we may be united in doctrine and in fellowship of your table confessing Christ boldly and living together in faith and love until our Lord returns in his glory to bring all things to their appointed completion when we will dwell in his house forever. Lord, in your mercy. O gracious Heavenly Father, we cry out for you for mercy during these difficult days. Please, O God, heal our land, bring peace to our neighborhoods and cities, Tear down the walls of hate and injustice that divide us. Raise up your church to be a life-giving force, ambassadors of reconciliation. Empower us for action that we will do more than talk, for it is time to act. May we model for our world the oneness in Christ, who, all, 
who alone is the hope of the world. Give wisdom to our civil authorities and faith leaders to make decisions and to lead us in directions that will lead to repentance, healing, forgiveness, new directions, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. peace and serve the Lord. I would like to thank the following people who make this taping possible. First, our ASL interpreter, Maria Coronado, our director of music, Katja Richardson, and our co-director of music, Roy Selden. Without these people, these tapings would not be possible. May God's be perfect peace be with you this week and always. To help us share the word that you have heard today, please hit like, subscribe, and to share this video with your family and friends. If you would like to join us for a in-person service at Peace Lutheran Church, we have a service at 9 and another service at 11 o'clock. Our 11 o'clock service is held in Spanish. If you would like to join us in Long Beach at St. John's, our service time is 12.30 p.m. I hope to see you in one of these services in the very near future. May God bless you always. Thank you for joining us today.